Hello and welcome to my retro watches. This episode is all about what we over here call the Mumbai Special. Now, before we go any further with this, uh, I never like that phrase. I know I've used it in the uh, title of the video and that's kind of to draw some viewers in. Uh, however, I think it's a bit detrimental to the whole of India and certainly all the people of Mumbai because they are not all the same and to try and class a watch as a special being derogatory I don't think is very fair. However there are some um, things we need to learn about some of these watches I feel and uh, I'm going to discuss them now. So first of all this is mine it's not a Seiko you see a lot of Seikos this one is a Kami and I bought this in 2016 whilst perusing eBay and thought I like the look of that yellow watch there and um, it said it was vintage I was very green back in 2016 I was just getting into a sort of my watch hobby I hadn't started taking it apart I just like to buy a few vintage and I thought wow someone's done excuse me someone's done a really good job for restoring that that looks ace and it was 13 UK pounds and uh, and a pound for delivery so I bought it and uh, it came and then I complimented the guy I emailed him saying you've done an amazing job and he sort of wrote back to me and says I didn't do an amazing job I just buy them from India and then sort of the penny dropped once I started putting it on the internet on some uh, some of the Facebook groups and people were saying ah it's a fake it's this it's that and I realized then that I'd sort of fell for something that wasn't entirely what it was supposed to be and over all these last four years, um, I've found that lots of people in the Facebook group, certainly when they're getting into uh, buying watches, uh, seem to buy a lot of these type of watches. Now there is an abundance of Seiko ones, and I feel that there are two sort of sides to the Mumbai special watches. I'm gonna sort of put some up somewhere over here for you to demonstrate. Now I feel that there are some like this that are um, all Seikos generally they're all very very brightly colored but when you look a bit closer to them and when you know a little bit of knowledge generally a lot of these are in genuine Seiko cases they have genuine Seiko movements they just might not have the right movement for the case back because the case back might be from a completely different watch and it usually is because mark my words I have bought some of these uh, since uh, mainly just to buy because I wanted to get the parts However, you know, I do a little bit of research, look at the case back, Google the image, uh, Google image search, sorry, the, the, the number, and it'll tell me which watch it's from. And I came to the conclusion that realistically, they're all really brightly colored. And in India, a lot of people over there do like brightly colored things. And equally, there's a split of very poor people and quite opulent people as well. And what say that these aren't made for the domestic market in India for, for the lower but uh, well, not lower class because that's been unfair isn't it the, the, the poorer people who want a mechanical watch and they've got these nice brightly colored Seikos and they buy them and they probably buy them for not a lot of money and then someone at some point has figured out that if they put them on eBay and they can sell them and they can sell them to people like us over here in the UK and further afield they can make a lot of money and for a 20 pound watch um, which is not a lot for us it could be quite a lot for them so I've always been on the fence. I don't think these ones are too bad. Uh, they have their place and a lot of people buy them and fall for it. However, people scream and say they're fakes and I don't think they are fakes. I just think they are just a, 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 an amalgamation of parts put together using genuine Seikos really, except for the dials that have been repainted. But what you also see is blatant fakes. and. In many respects, this one looks like one of them. I'll go into that in a moment. But if I put a picture of one up here of a typical Seiko, we keep seeing this actual particular particular Seiko in Seiko Passion Facebook group, actually. People keep falling for it. They say, oh, this looks great. Is this real? And then we all scream, no, because it looks obvious. It's, not, it's in a brand new case, which is not Seiko. The case back is not Seiko yet. It says it is, and it's got all the right codings on the back, but it's just a lie. The dial is incorrect. The, the, the Seiko logo is incorrect. It says made in Japan, that's incorrect. So it's, this is trying to deceive and trying to get people to pay good money 
for something that is not the genuine article. And those are definitely a fake, and those are the ones that I don't like and disagree with. Whereas the other ones, of course, I do think that they have a strange place in the market. Whether you agree with me or not, I don't know. I just don't think we should always cast dispersions uh, that everything is just a blatant fake and out to get money. They're not costing a lot of money at the end of the day. The, the, gen, the, the big fakes are, because some of those I've seen go for a lot of money, but the general bright coloured things are 20 pounds, $20, and that's nothing. And at the end of the day, you're getting a mechanical watch for that. So for that sort of money, where's the harm, seriously? When I look at this closer up, and when I do more research, what you tend to find is they all have, or these sort of ones, and Oris especially, they all have the same case. No matter what, it's the same case. So what lies beneath? That's what we're gonna find out. I did buy this, like I say, in 2012. I did take the case back off, uh, but I can't really remember what was in there. I knew it was a mechanical movement. Uh, and then I've just once I found out that it wasn't all it was supposed to be, it kind of put put in a drawer and was put away. And I felt that now we should perhaps do a little video, show you it closer up, and um, take it apart and put it back together again. And let's see what's inside because I've got no real idea, and it could be a journey. And see if at the end of that I've got something good for the very little amount of money that I spent on it. So it could be a bit of fun. Hopefully you'll stick with this video and watch it to its uh, entirety. So without further ado, I think we should cut to the bench and well, you can see the watch a bit more closer up and uh, let's start taking it apart. Okay, so here we are. You can see what I bought back in 2016. Now, again, I was really green. I didn't know one watch from another really. And this looks shiny and new. Uh, yeah, it said it was vintage. I kind of thought that uh, Cami was Swiss. And I was buying something really impressive uh, for not a lot of money. Um, and this is what I got. And, you know, to be honest, it isn't all that bad. If you <laughs> sort of. Um, it's got an interesting uh, sort of honeycomb texture to the dial. And if that's coming across, which I find um, still find really nice. I'm curious to know whether that was on an original dial perhaps and then they've sort of just repainted it because I've got no idea how they do it necessarily, whether this is a dial that's been made uh, specifically uh, for this particular watch. Certainly when you look closer up at the, uh, the, the markings, uh, which we might do on the microscope in actual fact, you can tell that it has been painted on but, uh, or, or at least stenciled on. You know, but again, for... 13 pounds what can we moan about it's it works fine uh, here we go on the case back um, it's just a press fit case back with some stampings and i'm more inclined to believe that this case back is not original it's probably original to this case but the um they've just someone's had a die and they've just stamped that uh, on it because it even looks like it's off center to me. So, you know, the more I'm looking at this even now, um, the more I'm sort of thinking, yeah, this is just blatant, uh, outright uh, fake. But let's take the back off and see what lurks underneath. Okay, there we go. So uh, that's interesting. I forgot that it actually said uh, uh, Cami on there. So that is a jeweled movement for certain uh, so again you know for my money that's not bad at all uh, this is obviously uh, just this spacer i can't even get it off is wedged in there we go and it's actually made dial move as well which is not too good but we have got a um appears to be a half decent mechanical movement. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, the balance off because there'll be a marking down there and it will tell us what the maker of this movement is or who the maker is, should I say, because that will give us some more clues. So I will just try and do that now. 
Right then, here we are on the microscope. I've removed the balance, and this is the motif or the logo that you can see underneath. And um, this, I've seen one of these before. So what you've got here is a backwards F and a forwards F, and what looks like a H in the middle. So it's an F, H, F. Uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but we'll have a look in a moment. Uh, it then says SI 96, so it's a version is 96. So F H F 96. Uh, so we can Google that uh, movement and it'll tell us a little bit more about it, which is what I'm going to do now. OK, so here we are on Google. So let's search for F H F movement. And here we go. There's one. So scroll down, here we go. So this is the name of the company, so what FHF stands for. I'm not really going to attempt to um, pronounce that. I'm not very good at other languages and I'll only make a mess of it. Uh, but what we can certainly see here is that it is a Swiss watch movement. Now my guess is it's probably been made by probably the million. Uh, but either way, it's still got some pedigree. So with that in mind, and we now know the maker's mark, let's search for the movement itself. So it's FHF 96. And go to my favourite site. Here we go. So what we can see here is a FHF 96. It's a manual wind with a sweep second it's telling us the dimensions. It's telling us that it's 17 joules, which is not bad. And it's got um, a beat rate of uh, 18,000 beats per hour and a power reserve of 48 hours, although that will be remains to be seen. Uh, if we look over on this side of the page, it's kind of telling us that some of the calibers here was in 1965. So perhaps the movement I've got is either a 65 or between, well, let's say it's between 65 and 75 perhaps, so it's still quite an old movement. So it remains to be seen once we service this, whether it's an old knackered movement or whether it's just an old movement that will actually still work correctly. So let's find out and we'll go back to the bench. Okay, just before I um, take it apart, I thought I'd put it on the time graph and see what we're gonna get. So we have a trace, <laughs> at least we have a trace. Terrible beat error, the uh, rate is appalling, and no amplitude. So it's probably gonna take a while to calculate the amplitude, if at all. Certainly doesn't look like it's gonna come through. The trace isn't as bad as I thought, really. I guess if, you, if I actually regulated this thing, it would, uh, be fairly reasonable, but let's see how much we can improve it. Okay, let's have a look at this dial. So I've taken it off and it intrigued me about the pattern. But when you turn it over, my conclusion is, looking at that, it doesn't look aged. So that is just completely, it's just a complete lie, basically, this dial. In every way, shape or form, uh, it's not been repurposed. Uh, it's been made specifically um, to deceive, I think be the right word. So I don't like the dial, say so it's a fake. Obviously we know the movement is still pretty good so let's crack on with the disassembly of that.
right there we go movement is all stripped down wasn't too complicated i don't think a uh, bit hard to separate some of the parts they seem to be a bit stuck again a clear indication that it hasn't been serviced in quite a long time so i thought just before we uh carry on with the next bit i would just put it on the microscope and have a quick look and straight away you can see that these jewels have all blocked up with old oil it doesn't look terribly terribly bad uh, but it's bad enough and obviously a good clean here is not going to go amiss so that's what's going to happen now i'm going to put the uh, parts in the watch cleaning machine clean everything up and then we'll rebuild and see what performance uh, we can get out of this movement Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that little cleaning montage there. That was just a, a little bit of fun, really, but it also indicates my process. Um, so there we go. We're now going to rebuild the movement, and I don't have a manual for this one, so I'm going to kind of oil where I feel is um, necessary. Uh, and before I kind of start the main build, I need to just turn this over i'm not so worried about finger cuts either to be honest with you because it, the honest truth is i'm not sure what i'm going to do with this watch uh, it's not exactly going to be um, a daily wearer so uh when i stripped it down what i didn't show there was a there's a jewel here it had a little plate on it and um, basically i need to put that plate back on so i took it off for cleaning and then I use the auto oiler to oil it. So I'll just put that little plate in place. like so and then we can flip it back over it's actually the uh, escape jewel and it should be uh, this one here i'm now getting myself confused <laughs> right so we'll just work that one out we'll get the auto oiler and we'll just oil that first because otherwise if we don't do it now be sure to forget about it later on okay here's the uh, a1 or 1a uh, auto oiler uh, by Bergeon. it has like a little stylus a little needle on the end and we're just going to place that in the jewel hole i know you can't see i really should have a b-roll by now but 
I don't. We just let the needle go into the jewel and it will deposit a very small droplet of oil in there. Sometimes for me, it can leave a little bit on the outside as well. So we'll just ready go that hole to be sure. So now we can crack on um, and build the main part. So first wheel to go in will be the uh, center wheel. And I'm just going to put a bit of Mobius D5 just on the inside. Now I will be using the microscope for some parts possibly, but for little bits like this, I'm just trying to make it a bit easier for myself really. So centre wheel will drop in. by two screws although it's not on properly is it there we go okay there we go so I'm now just going to oil the uh, the center jewel there, and also what I want to try and do, because I do this on my Seikos, is just put a little bit on there for the fourth wheel. And then while we're here, uh, I'm also going to um, put some grease and. Um, Molly Coat DX, just excuse me while I get it ready. On the uh, barrel uh, arbor, which is just uh, over here. So I might as well prep this hole as well. And I've got far too much on my oil after all of that. So, okay, so now we've oiled the arbor. Also, going to drop the barrel in. Now, I've never worked on this uh, movement before, this model, and um, so we'll see how we get on. Uh, but they do follow the general. They're all similar, should I say. They have the same sort of wheels and everything else. And certainly these hand wire movements, this sort of uh, lower caliber, if you like, all seem pretty much the same. And uh, they're good really for um, practicing on uh, cheap movements. So now we've got that in, we'll also just squeeze the escape wheel into position. I can see the jewel. Okay, third wheel just will drop into there like so. And if I go on my uh, gut instinct with Seiko's, when we have the fourth wheel, which is here, let me just try and take the autofocus off doesn't still doesn't help you um, like to just oil I can't see very well all the pinion and then that is gonna drop onto there okay that's good on with the uh, the next part so um, what do we fit next it's a good question 
And so first of all, I'm going to um, put in, I've got to try and remember where it goes now, over here. And that is the um, stem release screw. Uh, because the plate that goes on there is the um, uh, bridge for the barrel. Again, we've got three screws, so I'll put the screws in the hole, and uh, I won't let you suffer my fingers. I feel certainly for the regular watchers to my channel, you probably know the back of my hands just as well as I do. So now we'll attempt to fit the train wheel bridge. For that I just need to remember how it went which I think is like this and then it's a case of trying to tease the um, pinions into their respective jewels and like on many movements it's always the escape that seems to cause the trouble so I'm going to cut to the microscope for that microscope it can be a bit of a lifesaver um, as you can see I can now look at all of the pivots so the jaw holes and I can hopefully manipulate all of them into place. There. Hopefully you can see that one's in, which is the escape, and the other two are in as well. So now I can just put those screws in and uh, that's the train bridge done. So now the train bridge is on, we can just test that. So I'll just gently move the barrel and you hopefully can see the train is moving nice and freely. So the plan now before we start putting the escape in is I'm just going to build, put the ratchet on uh, so we can actually wind the thing up and um, just make sure again that that train runs nice. So we'll need to uh, fit the click. Just a little bit of maybe it's 9010 there. Okay, now it's time for the click spring. And these are pesky little things at the best of times. And uh, you've just got to get that one corner with the bent bit over here. Into position. I'm a little bit off camera there, aren't I? And hold it down with some peg wood. Oops, it's come out.
probably doing this totally the wrong way. But there we go. And then once you've got it in, hopefully you can see that. Uh, always just be a little bit careful about how you take away your tweezers, just in case it's not, because these things can jump, and when they do, uh, that's going to um, disappear across your bench, and you might lose that part completely. So once you're happy, then it's time for me to um, actually put the ratchet wheel on the top, and I'm just going to get a little bit of D5. Just into there. And then just trying to find the right screw. Right, and if I just put a little, little gentle turn, as you can see, the wheels turn around nicely. So we can now concentrate on putting the pallet and um, all of that side in now. I always like to uh, position the pallet on the microscope. It can be a little fiddly thing, and um, again, just under magnification, always makes these things. These little tricky jobs, certainly as a hobbyist, just makes it a little bit easier. There we are. And now it's going to be time for the pallet bridge, or pallet cock as they like to call it. And then once again, I've kind of got that in position. I kind of think my autofocus is playing havoc. Um, I will just double check that the uh, pivot is in in the jewel on the scope uh, before I secure it with the screw. So now for a bit of a tricky maneuver. This is uh, looking from the dial side through the little hole to access the escape um, pallet, which is where you would try and oil. And a lot of professionals use a coating on these so that the oil will stay in position. Um, myself, I just try and get some on there. And it's quite difficult. Um, I never like trying to do it this way, but it is the proper way. And if I, I was hoping this would come through, but it doesn't. I was gonna say, through, through my eyes on the microscope, the uplight from the microscope is absolutely perfect. Uh, but with for you guys, it's absolutely awful, isn't it? So. Plan B, which I'm guessing is probably going to be without any light at all. So this might not um, come through very well. So, just trying to see if you guys are in focus, which you're not. I've overalled it. You can see there's a big droplet on the side, which is a bit of a problem. Realistically, I haven't got enough room under my microscope for the oiler. I do need to uh, shorten it. Um, so I kind of ruined that. I'm going to clean that in a way. I'll get some Rodico in there now and take that bit off. It was just kind of to show you uh, that I was trying to do it, basically. <laughs> so. Uh, there we go, has and hasn't worked. Sometimes we try these things and they fail, don't we? So, camera. Um, so I'll just clean that up and then we can fit the balance. So there we go, there was my failed attempt at uh, oiling <laughs> the, the, the pallet there. Um, I was hoping that was gonna come through really well and I'd get brownie points from the more experienced out there saying I'm actually doing it right, but uh, there we go. Uh, you win some, you lose some. So I'm gonna try and fit the uh, balance now and uh, hope 
that we can uh, get this watch running again. And what I do need to do is just put a little bit of wind in. So yes, we can see it's uh, running. Okay, so there we go. That's uh, ticking away quite nicely. Of course, we've got to put all the keyless works in. Um, but um, I'm also going to oil the uh, end stone there for the shock jewel. Uh, but again, I'm not going to film that one. And I'll give you a reason why in a moment when we go onto the dial side. So I've now uh, oiled this uh, end stone. And while I'm here, I'm also going to oil the train jewels. What's worrying me, if you can see the staff there, the balance staff, it's wobbling around a little bit crazily in there and to me that's a bit uncharacteristic it seems a bit uh, too loose so it could be slightly bent who knows we don't know the history of this watch of course but so we've got these jewels here so like I say it's just going to be a little bit of 9010 into these So now we're looking at the dial side and we'll oil the uh, same jewels. Uh, we don't want to do the escape. And I've got this one here. Like so, of course, we've already done that with the auto oiler. And this is the one, um, this is why I said I wasn't going to show you on camera. Um, you have to excuse me, the camera's going bonk. For some reason I'm getting this strobing effect. We'll find out in editing whether it's still there. Um, so uh, this is a little sort of uh, difficult jewel. That jewel, that little one there is absolutely tiny and that's the bottom shock jewel for the balance wheel. And um, the little spring, brass spring it holds, it's been held in is an absolute bugger. I've never had one so bad. It took me uh, two seconds to take the thing off uh, but it took me at least 10 minutes to get it back on and it kept on jumping out at the same time and I even lost it at one stage as well. I've got a little tiny bit of footage which I'll put on now to show you that. Um, horrible, horrible thing. Um, but there we go. I managed to uh, find it again and I managed to fit it. So it was a bit of a bonus point because if I'd lost that, potentially this video would have been an absolute disaster. So now let's just concentrate on building the uh, keyless works and just again while I'm on the micro microscope I'm just going to oil these couple of um, points here so in preparation for the cannon pinion I just want to put some D5 on the side like so and I'm then going to put some 9010 just on the minute wheel uh, pinion there. And also a little bit of D5. For the index wheel there. And I've just seen a little bit of uh, lint. There we go. Okay, so first up, cannon pinion. And 
then we will be looking at the um, clutch. index wheel, if that's what you call it. And then we need the uh, driving wheel. If, excuse me, I'm just trying to get hold of it, which is going to drop into there. Now I also need to grease these really, uh, but for the moment I won't because again, too sure whether I'm going to use this watch. There we go. So next up is going to be the setting lever, and that goes on what is the screw on the other side. And uh, it's a bit like that problem I had with the bullover. I'm going to use my finger. I know I shouldn't but I am. <laughs> oh, I can just turn the screw. And that should be the setting lever at least screwed on there. There we go. So we'll just fit the a few of the other wheels while we're at it. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are on this uh, particular watch movement at least. Um, I'm sort of almost dreading your comments on the actual watch itself, uh, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'm bracing myself. So, okay, so we've got the yoke in. You can see that that's operating the clutch there quite nicely. I've just now got to fit the, the little spring that goes in there. Right, I realised I've got the spring on the wrong way, so I've just corrected that. Now it's time to fit the satin lever spring and then we're almost done. So we can just give that a quick test. Crown wheels come straight out, not the crown wheel, the next wheel. So let me sort that out. Okay, just showing again how um, how much of a hobbyist I am. I forgot we have a little plate that sits on there to secure that in place. And it comes with a real small screw as well but there we go it's in position and this time yeah so all we gotta do now is turn it over as I say I do these things in probably the wrong order uh, we can fit the uh, crown wheel assembly so a high friction point so D5, and it has this little washer, and then the wheel, and then the left-handed thread. the screw and there we have it so if I take that off this should now 
wide as it does. It's hard to wide with finger cuts. It's also fully wound as well because I tightened it right up uh, by hand with the screwdriver. So now the movement is complete other than the dial and the hands. I'm just going to actually take off the hour wheel for a sec. Let's put it on the timograph and see what sort of results we get. A little bit of a freehand recording. So it's definitely looking quite noisy, isn't it? Um, why am I not surprised, really, with that wobble that I thought we saw on the balance staff? Uh, the amplitude's come straight back, straight up, though, and, you know, the beat error is pretty good, and the rate's not too bad, just that the trace looks absolutely atrocious. So I'll try and improve that a little bit, um, and then stick the dial hands on, and we can do a little conclusion on this watch. Okay, dial and hands are back on, but I just wanted to show you this, because I was just going to put it in the case a little bit, and... Um, Here's the case, and I picked up the case, accidentally touched the inside of the crystal, <laughs> and it just pops out. And it's popping out, this is a, a real cheap um, acrylic crystal, and it hasn't even got a tension ring, and it should have. I mean, even with a tension ring, a crystal like that would only be a few English pounds, it'd be no money. Um, so, that's another bad point to it it's not being glued in it's just been pushed in like that and if you had bought this and worn it there's a good chance you would have lost that at some point and possibly have damaged the dial as well so that is very 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 poor what a shame okay i've cased the movement and uh tweaked the um regulator just a little bit uh, it's really really sensitive regulator actually it moves very easily and equally when you move the stud the regulator moves with it uh, so all bit worn and past its uh, prime i think but that said the readings are a little bit more um, accurate i think i could possibly get a little bit more but what is the point really you know the amplitude is there the rate is okay and the beta is okay and let's face it for 12 sorry 13 uk pounds i've got a mechanical watch that's within you know 19 seconds a day that's pretty good going to be honest with you i'm trying to think of good things to say about this watch i really really am okay so let's just sum up really uh, that was an experience i started off being quite um optimistic should we say and uh, a little bit pessimistic at the end um my thoughts are these watches um, certainly from a movement point of view they're a good thing to buy to practice on you know what a better way is to buy something so cheap that you can take apart and it doesn't matter if you get it wrong when you rebuild it um, it's just gaining lots of experience so it does have that use uh, but would I now wear this uh, absolutely not and uh, I can't enjoy it because I, I know what it is it's just a charade it's trying to be something that is not and uh, what a pity i guess if you didn't try and brand the dial with swiss made and a well-known vintage brand you know it would have a place because it would be honest in its um, appearance so there we go uh, i don't really want to waste more time on it it's been an interesting thing to cover uh, these watches do crop up a lot in the facebook group a lot of us fall for these certainly when we're just starting out and maybe they're a good learning curve for that very reason because all of a sudden you tune into what you know is genuine and what is not so you do learn a lesson through buying some of these so equally guys i'd like to hear all of your comments below so please um leave them i will read every one and i'll try and answer as many as i can but also please be respectful I know that some people might be very judgmental and want to post less than helpful comments, should we say. And don't forget, this is an international uh, forum that we're placing this on on YouTube. People from all over the world watch this, and I don't 
want to see any comments that are derogatory to the country where these have come from because uh, that would be not nice and I will delete those type of comments should they arise. So be respectful, uh, be interesting like I say to hear your thoughts. Thanks very much for watching, please give me a like, it really does help with the algorithm for my channel to grow a little bit more and uh, I will of course catch you in the next one. I've got a very good project coming up uh, that I'll be discussing hopefully within about a week. Bye for now guys.